All right. Welcome everyone to the virtual environmental ergonomics symposium. And I want to thank all of you for coming. I know some of you are new to this session. And so thank you for finding us and thank you for joining today. My name is Stephen Chung. I'm a professor at Brock University in the Niagara region in Canada. And along with Dr. Chris Tyler from the University of Roehampton in the UK and Dr. Tade Debevic from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia, we've been organizing these series of talks since mid-April. So this is the seventh one. So some of the ones, what we've tried to do with the idea of environmental ergonomics, environmental physiology is to have a broad approach to multiple environments. So we started off with research in isolation, and then we switched to heat adaptation, heat therapy, temperature sensation. We had a great session on firefighting physiology. And then last week's session was on pollution and exercise. And so we're really kind of trying to switch up the different environments and really looking at both the basic physiology and also applied. So for example, in the isolation session, we had Mark Hines, who is a professional adventurer talking about some of the extreme kind of uh, endurance events that he's taken part in. Same thing with the heat adaptation. We had a great talk by Chris Tyler about the science of heat adaptation. And then Jody Moss, who is also a PhD, talked about using that science in the field and in her case, in the Marathon des Saab last year. And same thing with the firefighting, we had both really good science talks and also the basic kind of looking at the entire spectrum of challenges that are facing firefighters. So this is gonna be the theme that we will see today too. We will have Trent Stellingworth talking about really the science of athlete preparation and especially environmental preparation. And then Evan Dunphy talking about it from an athlete perspective. For any of you who have missed or kind of want to catch up on some of these previous talks, you can go to our website, ICEE2021.com. And you'll see here under the uh, past talks, you can click on here and you will see links to all of our previous talks. So for example, here is the talk last week on pollution and exercise. What we also have for anyone who wants to use these for courses, I know a lot of us are switching possibly to online courses in the fall, or even just to uh, share with students and athletes. We also have student and instructor guides for each of them, and you can access them by clicking on the link here. So what they are is essentially a one-page summary uh, of the talk, a link to the talk, and also a few kind of thought questions or, or discussion questions that students can work on or instructors can discuss when they're. So they're available for almost all of the talks, and usually we post them kind of within the day or two of the talk itself. Some of the upcoming talks that we have, again, we're really trying to switch up multiple different environments. So the first half of kind of our summer session has been heavily kind of in the heat, but next week we're gonna to switch to cold physiology. So Dominique Gagnon is gonna talk about muscle metabolism in the cold and then Heather Massey at the University of Portsmouth is gonna apply it to her passion of open water swimming. Then we also have talks coming up on hypoxia physiology, pre-cooling in the heat, military physiology, and we have sessions planned up to June, sorry, July 16th. Then we're gonna take a summer break, and then we're gonna come back in early September with a virtual conference that is aimed for graduate students and postdocs in order to present some of the work, especially some of the work that they haven't been able to, to present this summer due to all the conferences being canceled. So that's kind of the, the theme of what we try to do here. And we hope um, you enjoy today's talk and that you be uh, able to join us in the future talks too. We have real kind of a excellent session today. It's something that I think we've been building up to and really looking forward to. 
again, we've talked about a lot of environmental adaptations and talking about the theory of it. Today, we're going to have a chance to putting it all together in a very applied setting. So we have Dr. Trent Stellingworth from the Canadian Sport Institute in Pacific out in Victoria on the far west coast of Canada, talking about kind of the science of the support that goes into a world champion performance, both the altitude training, the heat adaptation, and even the pollution adaptation. And we also have the real pleasure of having Canadian Olympian Evan Dunphy and bronze medalist at the Doha Worlds this past uh, October in the 50 kilometer race walk, talking about the, uh, the athlete perspective, how he felt through the different uh, challenges of leading up to this competition that was really unique in both the heat stress and also in the po pollution stress too. So what we have is, um, Trent and Evan are basically going to be tag teaming, talking back and forth. There's going to be a few natural spots there, breaks for questions. And because uh, Trent is going to start off with talking about some of the altitude preparation, then we're going to have a break. So during that first part, if you have any questions, use the Q&A tool down at the bottom and please send them to us. And then when we have that short little break, we will kind of have a round table of questions and then we'll proceed on to the next part of the talk, do the same thing again, have a break, answer some questions, and then continue on. So that's going to be the strategy for today. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and I'm going to allow Trent to uh, share his screen. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and thank you uh, uh, so much for pulling this together. I assume everyone can see my title slide and hear me okay? Awesome. And Evan, your uh, voice is okay on there for you to unmute when we need to? Perfect. Perfect. Always got to do the uh, technology check. Um, thanks so much for having us on, and I think uh, I'm really honored to be here, and especially honored to be here with, with Evan. Um, this will be a bit of a different talk than what we've had over the last six or seven in that it'll be very practical and very applied. It's really done on the backs of the amazing content and scientific content that's been presented already and that will be presented as Stephen just nicely introduced. Um, we will weave some science into this for sure. Um, we need evidence-based decision-making at the top level of sport, um, but it's gonna be more of a journey and more of a story. And so as I move forward, uh, the presentation overview will be in some chunks. I'll do a bit of an introduction We'll then talk about altitude. So during that section, if there's questions on altitude at the end of it, we'll uh, have a bit of a Q&A um, uh, uh, with Evan there, as well as take, taking questions. We'll then talk about heat. We'll again have a little bit of a pause for uh, question or Q&A with Evan and then uh, general um, questions for everyone viewing. And then we'll get uh, about putting it all together at the 2019 uh, Doha World Champs. So a bit of background info and, and case study. <clears throat> the Doha, 2019 Doha World Championships were very unique for a lot of reasons, mainly primarily due to the heat. I wanna emphasize Doha was announced in 2014, five years before the championship. And I will highlight that the local organizing committee for those Doha World Championships and the research that comes out of Aspire and Aspatar is world-class for heat. And they did an excellent job at, um, educating everyone involved, as did IAAF, now known as World Athletics. So this is, this is a slide right from an IAAF infographic. And so some of the issues for that was leading the charge local work. And so uh, as part of that infographic, um, you can see uh, athletics also highlighted which events are most impacted by the heat. This is an uh, analysis done on all the running events across uh, athletics. And you can see a comparison in percent change in performance in events 
over the years run over or are hotter than 25 Celsius versus cooler than 25 Celsius. And the sprint events are actually uh, generally get a benefit from the heat. Uh, the sprinters love warm weather, but the longer you go, uh, uh, the more that heat can impact performance. And in this instance, the average found in this study was 3%. Given the extreme conditions of DOA, we were having drop-offs in, in performance of eight to 12%, just to put things in perspective. And we'll touch on more, more of that later. And so this is an overview of 2019 for Evan, uh, laid out uh, by Evan and his coach, Jerry Dragomir. Jerry is absolutely instrumental in the work that we do with Evan. It's, it's absolutely always the coach-athlete relationship that drives these performances. And so you can see in blue altitude here in terms of St. Moritz uh, out here prior to the World Championships, the various spots throughout the year that Evan was exposed to heat. And then there's various competitions. And uh, Evan... Uh, always likes to spend the Canadian winter uh, in Australia, and he, he came straight from there into Phoenix. And uh, I'll highlight that this is a real team effort. So for example, these are all the time slots that I connected directly um, with Evan throughout the year. But we also had another physiologist, uh, Gareth, who um, was covering uh, Athletics Canada's pre-World Championship Altitude Camp in St. Moritz. I was here in Spain, so we were dividing and conquering. So some of our endurance athletes were here they then came into Spain for heat and then into the world championships. And that was very sequential on purpose, as you'll learn uh, in the next half an hour. I'll maybe pause there, um, uh, Evan, um, and ask you a little bit about your 2019 season. Um, obviously, you were on fire in 2016. You were fourth at the uh, Olympics. But then you had a bit of a lull and you kind of came back with ferocity in 2019. Is there any other context you want to put into this slide from your point of view? Um, in terms of looking at your season in this kind of benign way? Yeah, um, the, the only, I mean, looking at this, the context for me is that I raced 20K a week after racing 50K down there in April. That was pretty stupid. But mostly, <laughs> mostly this was, you know, this is um, what we do every year. You know, this is pretty typical. This is trained and, and practiced and routine and we know it works. Um, so there's no, you know, there was nothing in here that was a radical change from, uh, from the normal. So it was all, it was all pretty comfortable. It was all pretty familiar. For example, you know, St. Moritz, we've been there a, a half a dozen times now. So um, everything in, in this is just sort of, yeah, this is what we do every year. And, and, and we know that it works and, and we don't change the winning formula. That's great. And that's, that's definitely a recommendation. Great sports scientists give to all their athletes that they work with is, try to come up with a structure that can be adaptable to the year because our world championships and athletics change dates. It's not like cycling where it's always that kind of third week of September, it moves around. So it takes more planning, but within that planning, you can create structures that have familiarity for the, uh, for the athlete. So who is Evan? Uh, you know, Evan is a little boy all the way to the uh, picture here on the right, uh, walk into a world championship bronze medal. Um, you know, Evan's been around a long time. I actually looked it up, Evan, and, and we first crossed over at the 2010 uh, Commonwealth Games in India, although I was on the core staff and I think unavailable for the aid station. So the first major championship we kind of worked at was the 2013 um, Moscow World Champ seven years ago. And, um, you know, Evan's a Pan Am Games gold medalist. He was fourth at the Rio Olympics. Uh, he's won multiple medals in race walk team challenges, some of them uh, a few years later due to doping situations. Uh, and then last year, he was a bronze medalist in the 50K walk at the 2019 World Championships. If you don't follow this guy on Twitter, please do. Uh, his content is, um, is on point. He's not afraid to speak up. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a funny guy with a great sense of humor. He's a staunch anti-doping activist um, and an advocate, both activist and advocate. Uh, does tons of work with kids. Uh, dare I say, uh, north of 100 school visits a year, Evan, where, where are you at with that? And, and a strong sense of sportsmanship. So Evan, can you give us a, maybe a little more background on, on, on what you got into the sport originally? And yeah. maybe some of the things outside of the sport that brings value to your life that you love to do. For sure. Um, I mean, you can see on the screen here, uh, little Evan. Uh, little Evan was you know, a kid that loved sport and, and wasn't really good at anything. Um, I was the shortest kid in the class, uh, you know, big thick glasses, the red curly hair, some things don't change. 
Um, but I, you know, I, I was trying all these different sports, wasn't really good at anything, found running just through a, a, a lunchtime run at my elementary school and realized, well, I can go for a really long period of time and, and not get tired. And, and, oh, that's my advantage. That's, that's the thing that I can do. And um, nine years old, joined a track club. I uh, was running with Richmond Kajax. Um, a year later, my brother was d- done the same thing. He'd also been running with the cl- track club, had his appendix taken out. High school coach at the time thought, okay, well, um, there's this thing called race walking. Don't really know much about it, but what if we, what if you do some race walking when your stitches heal, you come back to running and you'll still have fitness. My brother tried that, went pretty well. I think he finished third in his first race. Honestly, there's probably only four kids in the race, but I was as a younger brother, like, Hey, if he can do it, must be pretty easy. Went to my first race. Um, still remember that first race, 800 meter race, stand on the start line, the kid next to me asking me what I want to do. I had no idea. So I just said five minutes. Uh, he told me I'd never do that on my first try. I ended up going 458 and winning the race and knew from 10 years old that race walking was going to be the thing that was, you know, I was going to try and be successful. And I, I had wanted to go to the Olympics from the time I was nine, 10 years old. My, my dad had coached in, in Munich in 72. Um, and I'd just grown up hearing about this thing, the Olympics, that sounded really fun and, um, you know, give that a shot. So kind of kept going from there. It was pretty good as a younger athlete, set Canadian um, under 18 and under 20 records. As Trent said, went to the Commonwealth Games in, in 2010 as a 20-year-old. Um, pretty inconsistent those first few years internationally on the senior team. A couple dropouts, a couple, um, you know, finishing towards the back of the pack. And then in 2014, I graduated um, from University of British Columbia with my um, bachelor's in kinesiology and sort of went full-time athlete mode. And since then, I've had nine straight world championships finishing in the top 16 um, and just been able to put together you know, a really consistent, um, consistent uh, uh, career. And, um, you know, yeah, training, training for Tokyo now. And, um, you know, for me off the track, I think, you know, sport has really taught me everything, you know, every, every quality I have as a person, um, for better or for worse, I attribute to sport. Um, it's really shaped who I am as a person. And, um, you know, I was a really sore loser growing up. Um, didn't, you know, winning was the only thing that mattered and, and through great coaches and, and through great, um, you know, sports psychologists and, and a great team around me, I've been able to switch my mindset and, and redefine what success looks like. And, you know, I've just been really lucky. So, you know, my biggest passion is making sure that everyone, you know, especially, you know, mostly with kids working with like charities, like kids sport, making sure that everyone has that same opportunity that I had in sport, because, um, you know, I've seen the power that can have to change lives. So, everyone should be as lucky as I was to get that opportunity. So that's probably my biggest passion. And then with that comes, you know, the tentacles of keeping sport clean, um, free from doping and, and, you know, all the sorts of things that all the different tangents I like to go down. Yeah, that's awesome. And so I think for, I know we have a really wide audience listening in today. I I think for up and coming, you know, younger folk, uh, either athletes or, or support staff or sports scientists, uh, one of the key things that is going to come out of the, uh, this, this webinar is the, the concept of team. And I think also the concept of, um, of process and not always just the outcome. And, and I think, I hope that will shine through throughout this presentation. Um, so moving forward, we'll now do this section on, on altitude application um, for elite athletes. And I thought I'd start um, just highlighting uh, a gargantuan review that I had the uh, honor and pleasure to be a part of last year with, with Inigo and Avish. And um, for any of you interested in uh, periodization of training for elite altitude training, um, yeah, please look up this review. I'll highlight bits and pieces of it uh, throughout this presentation, but um, that was a big one that came out last year. And, and, and kind of United Nations is uh, Inigo is is Basque and Avish comes from Australia and of course I'm Canadian and it, it was it was great to collaborate with these these guys and one of the things uh, in that review is we we used actual case study information and this is a uh, table one in that review and it's an athlete that Inigo had worked with and um, she's an Olympic gold medalist in swimming and I just wanted to highlight the type of structure that you see from season to season Evan already mentioned the consistency of having a bit of a set plan We'll, well, look at this here. This exactly leads into this swimmer in terms of her altitude planning over many, many years. 
And so over an eight year period, this athlete utilized altitude training for 120 weeks or about 30% of her total training time was, was north of 1800 meters. And so uh, those are planned and there's different purposes, you know, in the fall and altitude camp and what you're looking to get out of it in terms of adaptation and physiology is a lot different than a pre-championship altitude camp. They, they have different purposes. This is a quote, not in the paper, but just that I threw together for here. I, I might suggest that there are not many elite endurance athletes who have not tried or used hypoxia as part of their periodized plans, full stop. And I know that there's controversy back and forth about whether or not altitude training improves performance or not. You can uh, look up that, that, that recent um, uh, back and forth letter in, in JAP. I think it is, yeah, JAP. Um, but the fact is almost every single elite athlete whose competition's north in about a couple of minutes, three minutes, um, at certain times, um, absolutely has tried altitude. And I believe when it's monitored well, implemented well, it is a, an excellent tool in your tool belt to use to, to enhance adaptation and performance. So what are some of those acclimations? Again, we're gonna be pretty basic here. Um, there's some um, acute responses as soon as you uh, arrive at altitude in terms of hyperventilation and respiratory alkalosis, increase in sympathetic activity, um, which then translates in, into maybe over several weeks, you get your non-hematological adaptations. So mainly uh, the idea there, uh, increase in muscle buffering, blood buffering capacity, perhaps increase in enzymes, so more muscular adaptations. Um, I'll highlight that our knowledge in elite athletes on acute responses and these structural non-hematological responses at 2000 meters of altitude that is typically used is almost non-existent. There's a handful of papers. So uh, in terms of muscle biopsies to look at muscle buffering and altitude at 2000 meters, um, I can think of a, one from Chris Gore and one from Ben Saltine. Uh, we're, we're talking N equals six. It's hard research. It's invasive research for muscle biopsies. But there does seem to be a suggestion that some of these um, anaerobic or muscle buffering um, adaptations may, may happen on the order of, of just a few weeks because those, pap those papers, they showed um, some pretty robust changes in, in just 14 days. What we do know a lot more about is the more prolonged or longer term blood changes. So the hematological changes. Obviously, uh, when you're exposed to um, uh, hypoxia, uh, you're, uh, there's a desaturation, which is sensed by your kidneys, which releases EPO, which increases reticulocytes, which eventually leads to increases in uh, hemoglobin mass or red cell mass. Uh, this is more in the order of three or four weeks, more on that in a few slides, and is best measured through um, carbon monoxide rebreathe um, methodology in terms of really your best detection limits. But again, I think it's important to stress that a lot of athletes go to altitude with just the concept that they're gonna get an increase in red blood cell mass, but there's probably a lot of other adaptations that are going on. And just because you might have only shown a 1% or non, uh, a trivial change in red cell mass doesn't mean there wasn't a lot of positive things going on um, inside of your muscles. And if you look, if you look at uh, HIF-1 alpha, um, hypoxic inducing factor, and you look at its downstream targets, which, <laughs> which is like, it feels like it's almost everything in, bio, in the muscle, um, you can probably understand how, um, uh, how complex the adaptations to altitude really can be. When it comes to best practice for monitoring altitude, this is critical. Uh, I would suggest that almost everything on here, um, minus some of the blood work perhaps, are the exact same best practicing you need for heat. So I'm not gonna recover that there. It's really important to try to get an internal load metric and track that. So that could be heart rate, RPE, uh, and get an external load metric and track that. That's, you know, speed or wattage. It's really uh, most effective to get some norms on your athlete at sea level or in cool weather conditions for those two metrics. And once they go to altitude or once they go into a heat, you then have a pretty good framework of some of, the, some of their tolerances to speeds and RPEs. And it's really good initially when going into the heat or into altitude to try to clamp training more towards internal RPE or heart rates to just help control things a little more. Yes, that will result in lower speeds and wattages, but um, it also uh, will result in better adaptation. Uh, body mass, body composition tracking can, can be implemented as, as one of a 
somewhat poor indicator of energy availability, but uh, I'll show later uh, energy is involved uh, and having adequate energy availability for optimal adaptations for blood is important. Obviously blood test prior to, a little more on that later, just so you know your iron status, altitude and iron go hand in hand. Uh, hydration status, many times uh, when you arrive in the heat or at altitude, um, hydration can be compromised and um, uh, a morning USG with thirst, with body weight tracking is a nice trifecta to just kind of drill in generally uh, in terms of some sense of hydration. And then some performance indicators. Ideally, uh, you might add, but maybe not absolutely necessary, bloods afterwards, hemoglobin mass pre-post, oxygen saturation at resting and training. You can see some nice adaptive responses there. Um, perhaps heart rate variability and other testing. But um, the ones at the top, uh, um, you know, minus a normal routine blood test, um, every single one of us can execute with a heart rate strap and, and pen and paper um, and a GPS for speed. So moving forward in the review again, I, I don't expect you to be able to read all this. Uh, we did highlight some of our potential modifications to training and I'll just highlight them as a theme. Down the left side, we have weeks at altitude and across the top, we have overall volume and then we have intensity and we have rest during intervals. And these are generally some of the kind of themes that you need to think about as an athlete or coach. Uh, in week one, uh, you probably have a small reduction of 10 or 20% in volume as you adapt to the altitude. Although altitude experienced athletes, there's emerging data to suggest elite athletes can tolerate high training volumes um, upon arrival to altitude. It really depends on your experience level. And I might suggest it also depends on how many time zones and what the travel fatigue and some of those other confounding factors are upon arrival. That said, that first week exercise intensity, you do need a large absolute decrease. Um, and you probably need to double your rest intervals. As you progress through week two, three, and four, volumes can be normal to sea level. Um, intensities still tend to be a little bit lower at altitude. Uh, rest uh, intervals still need to be increased, and that's probably, e even by week three and four, um, you still probably need a 25 to 50% increase in your rest intervals at altitude to hit the qualities and the speeds and the wattages that you hope that are similar to sea level. I might suggest that in many reasons, um, some of our favorite altitude locations around the world are one at a certain altitude, more on that later, but also have easy availability to getting down the mountain to doing quality training sessions at lower altitudes. So in Flagstaff, we can drop down to Sedona. Um, at St. Moritz, you can drop down to Chiavenna uh, in Italy or other locations to do your low sessions. So that a small percentage of the week you know, maybe it's a total of five hours in the whole week, you've dropped down um, to be able to really nail high quality sessions. Um, I think that's a really important aspect to consider. Other important as aspects to consider is that, um, you know, the time in the heat, exercising in the heat with elevated core temperatures or the time in altitude here, exercising in altitude with desaturations are very different in say an 800 meter runner who runs 50 kilometers a week, which takes like four hours. That's a pretty good week for some 800 runners versus a professional cyclist where they're doing 20 or 30 hours a week. It is so much easier in high volume sports to get altitude adaptations, but also easier to overcook them and heat adaptations just by the fact that they're doing a lot more volume. So you have a lot more training time to play with. And th those are just important considerations to think about. The neuromuscular aspects are really important too, as I said about training low. And so a sport like swimming, it's, it can be really challenging. Um, you can only swim so slow. And if your lactates are up at five, every single swim, because you don't have the technical expertise at altitude, um, it, it can be a problem. How long to stay at altitude? I'm gonna rip through these pretty quickly as there's some great talks in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we generally, for red cell mass, suggest three or four weeks, as you can see from this graph. Perhaps there's some indications for uh, muscle buffering. It's more around two weeks. I want to highlight, like, if, if you're kind of new to altitude research, please check out some of the work from Robert Chapman. Um, he's got some great, uh, great science that's really applicable. I'll highlight this one paper here that I, I, I would really stress is a must-read if you're a coach athlete thinking about altitude training. 
Um, we could spend half an hour unpacking this. Uh, we won't, but he sent uh, uh, four groups of 12 elite runners to live and train over four week period, as you can see here, at four different altitudes. And generally speaking, the, the most popular altitudes tend to be in this kind of 2000 to 2400 meter range. What did they find? Well, here on the left is the 3000 meter race time trial improvement as a percent change from pre-altitude baseline. So the two groups that had statistical improvement were this group at 2000 meters and 2400 meters. Interestingly enough, the athletes in the group who trained at 1700 meters which tends to show a bit of a blunted red blood cell response compared to that 2000 to 2400, as well as the 2800 meter group did not get these performance benefits. And perhaps at this 2800 meter group, and the paper talks about this, it's, it's really challenging at those altitudes to have a high quality level of speed in your training, especially at 3000 meter race pace. Uh, is you just can't do it, it's so high. You end up trudging along and there's a large neuromuscular component that needs to be considered and biomechanical efficiency to generate speed or wattage that needs to be considered. Two weeks later, the results on the 3000 meter race time were nearly identical. This is different than the VO2 max data because VO2 max isn't measuring, in this instance, um, wattage or speed at VO2 max, this is just how much oxygen can your body process? And here, right after altitude, probably because they got the biggest red cell mass, I, I'd have to check in the paper, uh, the VO2 max was a trend for highest at the highest altitude. But again, from a neuromuscular efficiency to use that engine to generate speed and performance, which is what we're most after, there was a disconnect. So again, just thinking beyond the biology and the physiology and looking at performance metrics, there's complexity here. What about return from altitude to competition? Uh, this is an image I stole from, from Rob, from Robert Chapman in 2011. Um, there's a lot of, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, this is way more art than science for all of us. Uh, there's just not a lot of data on return to altitude and optimizing competition performance. That says there's probably some anecdotal thoughts that there's initially within the first few days coming out of altitude, a good timing for race performance. A lot of athletes then seem to have a really sluggish period somewhere you know, between days five and 10 or seven and 14, where there may be, and there has been measured an increased cost of breathing. So you continue to hyperventilate upon return to sea level. And that, that comes at an energetic cost during racing. Perhaps there's residual fatigue and recovery is still kind of off, or, um, compromised at that point. And then there does seem to be a good timing again as you come out after a couple of weeks for performances. Um, I've generally kind of seen this in practice. I would just add massive error bars here as I think uh, what you do in that last seven to 10 days at altitude in terms of training and fatigue will really dictate these windows and what this looks like, if these even exist. I've seen great performances across all these days. And I think um, a lot of coaches get, st get stuck in their sea level taper periodi periodization and just apply it to altitude. And sometimes forget, oh, I gotta, I gotta give a leave in a little further reduction on this taper at altitude because of the stress of the environment. I can't just do my normal sea level taper. And uh, so I, I would suggest that residual fatigue and the type of training you've done in those last seven or 10 days is probably the biggest factor to performance rather than, in my humble opinion, uh, some of these other more um, physiological and biological explanations. A lot more work needs to be done here though. And I think anyone in altitude research would agree. 2019 was a busy year. I also had the pleasure of writing, a, 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 again, a massive review with a whole bunch of amazing co-authors here. Um, you can see all their names and, and photos, a real team effort on nutrition and altitude. Uh, I'll highlight bits and bobs of it. Again, this is an open access one. Um, one of the key themes, again, just like the altitude biology, physiology adaptations, same with nutrition. Our knowledge on changes in nutrition at 2000 meters or moderate altitudes is, is very, is almost non-existent. And that's primarily due to the fact that most of the research is done at 4,000, 5,000, more mountaineering and extreme altitudes. Uh, Pikes Peak, for example, tons of great research out of that US military base, but that's at 4,032 meters. Whether that's relevant to 2000 meters really remains to be seen. 
So we've done over the years, uh, just some photos, uh, a series of studies, a whole bunch of studies at, in Flagstaff, Athletics Canada, the governing body of track and field in Canada um, has a, uh, a, a camp there every single April where we'll get between 20 and 40 athletes. There's probably another 200 international athletes in staggered around Flagstaff. The weather for altitude globally at that time of the year is probably the best. St. Moritz still has quite a bit of snow in April. And so we'll design uh, studies in and around uh, altitude training camps. Um, this took a ton of time and trust and development before we could even do our first little study. Um, you know, this is my son helping uh, hand out, um, I will say sanitized urine collection cups, uh, you know, going to the athletes doors with me. And we, I have my family there. We're up there for many, many, many weeks. Uh, everyone gets involved and again, a big team effort. And so uh, again, usually uh, we'll make a poster. All these athletes are okay with their photos on this poster and okay with them being shown. And what we try to do is design studies that are as simple as possible for the athlete. So we have a local lab there, Hypo2. Um, uh, uh, we've got a great relationship with Dan Berglund, the physiologist at that lab. Um, the owner, uh, Sean and I have known each other for almost 15 years. And they have hemoglobin mass set up there in Flagstaff. Uh, so we tap into Dan and Dan's on our papers. Um, Dan's here in this photo and he'll help organize local nurses that'll arrive at my, um, uh, at my condo and we set up an entire mini lab. And the athletes can literally walk over in their pajamas, pajamas for their blood draws. We want to make it that simple for them. Um, we've done things like DEXAs up there, uh, hemoglobin mass, um, obviously blood draws. And, and generally speaking, this stuff just doesn't get done without incredible collaboration from the athletes and the coaches. And, and we're always indebted, indebted to them. So as one example, a few years ago, um, at the time we had a registered dietitian from Australia, Beck Hall here in the photos, who was really interested in iron. So we designed a study around the altitude camp as she worked with Athletics Canada. And I had never done iron research. And so the first person I contacted was Pete Peeling because Pete's the legend in iron and athletes. And um, Pete came on board to help us, you know, work through a good study protocol. He came on board. I, I said, you know, we would really love you involved with the paper. And then literally like a month before I had a little bit of cushion in my budget. I said, hey, Pete, this is going to be crazy. Why don't you just fly out to Flagstaff for the first week and join us? And the guy did. What, what, an, uh, what an awesome situation. He came right out to Flagstaff and, and joined us for the, for the baseline testing. And so basically in this study, we had 26 elite runners attending a three-week camp. And when I say elite, um, uh, probably 25 to 50% of these athletes can make a, an Olympic team. This is the elite of the elite. We had hemoglobin mass pre-post, blood draws for ferritin and hepcidin, food frequency questionnaires. You, you can see the paper, it's published now. And we split them into two groups um, where we base the uh, baseline on baseline ferritin and hemoglobin mass, as well as um, sex, because we had males and females. And both groups got 200 milligrams of iron per day. There's pretty good evidence to suggest 200 is there. Andy Govis's paper is, uh, you can check that out. But we just dosed it differently. Uh, in one instance, the dose was split 100 milligrams in the morning, 100 milligrams at night, and group two got a 200 milligrams altogether. And this was based on recent paper that came out the year before out of Italy by Moretti et al, showing that iron dosing itself increases hepcidin release. And hepcidin is a, is a hormone which blocks iron absorption primarily at the interior site. There's a, there's a large cascade there. But iron itself blocks that. And this paper showed that by splitting the dose, you actually lowered the bioavailability because hepcidin was being released twice per day. So our hypothesis was that group two, the single dose would probably be better for iron bioavailability, iron uptake, and would result in more hemoglobin mass during the camp. And indeed, uh, you know, a p-value of 0 0.048, um, we did see that the single dose resulted in slightly greater hemoglobin mass changes than the split dose. Uh, I'm gonna be honest in terms of like, uh, how tight these groups were. There wasn't a huge, massive radical change. Um, that said, uh, we're just looking at hemoglobin turnover uh, over just three weeks and, and red cells have approximately a lifespan of 120 days. 
but it kind of fit with the data and it, it was a good practical question we could go at. A lot of people get nervous about 200 milligrams of elemental iron. Um, again, we, we only prescribe that for individuals who have ferritins under about 150 and only during altitude, those kind of levels. But you can see the ferritins here, you know, and they move up maybe five or 10 units. They don't go out of control at all with um, that level of iron intake. Um, and so I, I just wanted to highlight that as well. The other uh, interesting bit is there was a, a further increase in ferritin, uh, in, um, interestingly enough, in the split group. So the bioavailability perhaps was better in the single group as more of it was being assimilated into the red cell mass that you see in the hemoglobin on the left. In 2016, we did a whole other series of papers, a massive study led by Dr. Ida Hakura, um, a whole bunch of questions. I'll just highlight the papers there. I don't have time to go through them all. I will highlight one key outcome that came out of that paper. And that was upon arrival to altitude, we found that amenorrheic females, so N equals 13, so females without a menstrual cycle, probably the number one indicator of a low energy availability or, or REDS, relative energy deficiency in sport, had 8% lower hemoglobin masses than the eumenorrheic females. And again, I've expressed this corrected by body weight. And so if I take our entire data set just from four years of 65 different women at altitude over four or five different camps, on average, we've done pretty well and shown an average 6% increase in hemoglobin mass at our camps. But I just wanted to put that 6% there next to the 8% to put it in perspective. Athletes are spending thousands and thousands of dollars to fly to altitude, rent a condo to get on average a 6% increase. When in many instances, a, on average, amenorrheic females, if they could correct low energy availability, they might just get an 8% increase in hemoglobin mass there. Uh, there's not many studies out there that has looked at this yet and altitude with carbon monoxide rebreathe. This needs to be reconfirmed, but it's, uh, you know, we had pretty good numbers there and uh, it, it is a line in the paper that I've highlighted there. So I will pause there. Uh, that's the altitude section, probably the longest section and uh, ask Evan to just be ready again. Um, Evan actually wrote at his local Richmond News newspaper in 2016, a, a few articles for them in his lead up to the games. Here's some pictures of his group uh, here at Altitude. And um, maybe the first question, Evan, that I'll have for you is, um, there, I have never seen a group in athletics, and, and maybe in the marathoners, but even more in the race walkers, where there's such group camaraderie. I think there's like three or four different nations here in this photo here on the right. All of these guys participated in our studies. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about the power of numbers that you get with training, not just with Canadians, but with just people around the world and how important that is, is for your preparation, Evan? Yeah. I mean, I think for, for starters, it's, it's out of necessity. I mean, training, trying to find a group of elite Canadian race walkers, um, you, you, know, you wouldn't have any success. Um, so you, 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 you team up with those that are best in the world. I mean, that's one thing that we got from Jerry, my coach early on was that, okay, well, if we want to be the best in the world, let's go to the best in the world and see what they're doing. And at the time, um, that was Jared Talent in Australia and, and, you know, working with Louise and, uh, and all that stuff down there. So 20, 2012 and, or 2011 and Aki, my teammate went down to Australia, trained with Jared and all these guys came back and said, Holy crap, this is what they're doing. Like, this is amazing. Like, this is what we need to be doing if we want to, if we want to be, uh, you know, be like them. And, and basically from there, um, for me, 2012 was my first camp and, and we just, just had this camaraderie. As you said, there's one, two, there's yeah, Canada, USA, Australia, and New Zealand in that photo. Um, just, yeah, coming together with that camaraderie and, and it's, it is great. It is, it's, it's so necessary. I mean, you look at some of the research that we've done sort of aside from this with the supernova camps, um, in Australia, looking at nutritional stuff and you just, it allows you to be a part of this, um, you know, a part of this research that you guys are doing in large numbers and getting 20 athletes together that are all quote unquote elite. Um, and you all make each other better. That's, I think that's the, the biggest takeaway is that you know, everyone comes out of that camp, a better athlete, um, you know, regardless of the fact that you're training against your competitors, if, if you all improve the same amount, you're still, you know, you, you still are going to be better than the person you were better than before but now you're both going to be better than the people that aren't training with you. Um, 
So when you break it down to its simplest, it, it just kind of makes sense to work together. Maybe Kevin, if I can question. break in with, Go ahead a, there, Stephen. Uh, with a question of you, you talked at the start and Trent talked to start about you finding something that worked for you. Uh, can you talk us through the process in terms of like the altitude camps and the timing of them? Like how, how much trial and error was that? How much of it was kind of guided by science? How did you end up kind of locking into a system that kind of in schedule that worked for you? Yeah, it, it's pretty much all been guided by science. Um, you know, we either um, follow, follow Trent's lead or follow Brent Valance, uh, one of the coaches in Australia. Um, you know, amazing coach. Um, you know, he works very closely with, um, you know, with, with the Australian Institute of Sports stuff. So um, we're all sort of always kind of following that science best practice. But then um, the biggest fine tuning has always been what I do once I'm at altitude. Um, so the timing has never really changed. We're always sort of aiming for three to four weeks at altitude. We're always aiming to compete sort of, uh, you know, two to three weeks down from altitude. Um, but what's changed and what's been fine tuned is, you know, how, what do we do before we go to altitude? So we've experimented with doing, what we'll, I think we'll talk about later, we've experimented with doing heat before altitude. Um, we've experimented with, um, you know, coming in off a really high training block, coming in off a lower training block, um, experimented with, really trying to crush the intensity at altitude and, and um, you know once once we sort of realized what kind of worked the best it was that was sort of the fine-tuning the the, you know, the structure is in place the structure is the science um, that says go for this long compete at this point and then within that it was the fine-tuning of okay what works for me and, and you know as Trent said using a lot of those monitoring things um, I think for a number of years we were doing that implicitly we didn't even know we were doing it it was just through conversations with um, with Jerry, with my coach saying, how do you feel today? Oh yeah, I feel kind of, feel kind of crappy. And yeah, we weren't specifically writing down RPEs, but without really knowing it, we were kind of building that same foundation of, of what Trent sort of recommended. And then nowadays we do do a lot more stuff with, uh, with written down diaries, RP, RPEs and all that stuff and, and, and judging it that way. So um, that's sort of the fine tuning that we've done a lot of. Um, I hope that answers, answers that question. Steve, you're on mute. Steve, you're on mute. Oh, okay, sorry. Was there any other questions, Steve? Or otherwise, I'll move on to the next section. Oh, you're, you're still on uh, mute, Steve. Whilst, uh, whilst Stephen's struggling, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll ask one. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot in the question and answer, which is really good to see. Um, an easy, quick one, hopefully. Um, it says, for those not familiar with race walking, what is the sort of intensity that you would be exercising at percentage of max or whatever? Yeah, a perfect question. Um, I like to explain race walking as running with rules. So, you know, anyone familiar with, with marathon training, it's, it's pretty much the exact same thing. We're just doing it within the confines of having to keep one foot on the ground at all times and having our front leg straight. So, um, you know, everything else is the same. My VO2 max is, um, you know, on a good day, mid seventies, um, I'm able to achieve that through race walking can get my heart rate up to, you know, average heart rate over, um, a, a 20 K race walk is about 178. Um, so, you know, looking at 90 plus percent of max. So all the aerobic components are the same as you would get in a marathon runner. We're just going a little bit slower because we're confined by, by these rules. Um, and then the only other difference I'd say that's important is that we don't have the same typical um, sit and kick championship style racing as you would get in a marathon where they just dawdle along for, um, you know, 30K occasionally and then, and then ramp it up. Because we're confined by those rules, you tend to get, um, you know, a more consistent, um, you know, longer sort of sprint, if you will, because you're not able to, to do the same sort of above anaerobic threshold type type work. I would add two other key differentiators. Uh, World Class Marathon is done just north of two hours while well, you guys are out there for three and a half to four hours. And so that extra distance and length really impacts on your hydration and fueling plan. You, you gotta be a lot more aggressive in the race walk. And secondly, uh, when, when Evan tests, if you look at running economy, a good running economy in a marathon or is you know, 180, mls per kg per kilometer um, because of the constraints of the rules of the race race walking is quite inefficient and the economies are, are pretty dreadful they're up at like 
two forties. And, but then if you flip it around, it's like, it is so impressive with those types of economies and the stress on that system, uh, what they're able to do for 50 K from a physiological perspective and an energetics perspective. It's, it's an impressive event. Just to feed off of that, Evan, uh, now that I'm back off mute, but the, um, like, how do you, I guess, first, when you go up to altitude, like, how do you feel? And then also, how do you feel kind of altitude benefits you personally when you, when you come back? Do you feel it's kind of that efficiency? Everything seems to just flow easier or, or is it kind of, do you feel kind of, a, it's more of a cardiorespiratory benefit? So can you talk us through how you feel when you first arrive at altitude? And also when you come back. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we've learned the last couple of years is when we first get up to altitude and usually we're in St. Moritz, we've done Flagstaff uh, just, just once in 2016 uh, before our, our world team championship. So we were up there in, in April with Trent in 2016. Um, but most of my altitude experience has either been in St. Moritz or occasionally in the altitude house at um, the AIS in Canberra. Um, so using that as an example, like St. Moritz, 1800 meters it's it's not uh you know it's on the lower end of, of what you would use so we get up there we don't feel too too bad right off the top so this year i came in straight from lima i was at the pan pan american games in lima raced um and about raced 20k and about four days later was in st moritz so that was kind of rest by necessity we got into st moritz had a few easy days just because i was coming off the back of stupidly long travel i think it was about 24 hours of, of travel to get there from lima um as well as having raced so there was a recovery aspect there and and really just took training slow and and as the weeks went on just ramped up throughout the whole thing and, and left left that camp to to barcelona for some heat stuff feeling um you know incredibly fit incredibly um, primed and ready to go and then then from there, it was just, okay, now we start to back things off. But we ended that camp on a high note. Some other years when our camps have been a little bit longer, 2016 in St. Moritz, we were there for just over four weeks. So we were able to come back down a little bit at the end of the camp. So end of the camp, instead of being this high intensity, high volume week was a little bit more lower volume, higher intensity um, kind of priming. So again, sometimes it's dictated on, on this, you know, the demands of the season and where you're at, what you've come in from. Um, but, you know, generally feeling wise, um, it's, it's gotten better every time I've gone. Um, every year I go in with a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more um, understanding of how I should feel. And that barometer just makes it so much easier to deal with, oh, why do I feel so tired right now? And they go, oh no, I'm, you know, I always feel this tired in the first week and I can go back and look at training and say, oh, okay, you know, yeah, I feel like I'm going really slow right now, but Hey, this is the exact same thing I did last year. And then look how that camp ended uh, and look how I raced at the end of it. So, um, you know, that knowledge that you gain uh, you know, cumulatively is super valuable. Great. And then maybe just the final question, maybe for both uh, Trent and, Evan is what, what is your view towards kind of hypoxic chambers or houses and, and, uh, sleep chambers as opposed to, you know, an actual altitude. So that, that whole kind of nor normal barrack versus hypobaric model. Do you want me to give that one a go, Evan? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if you're interested to look at specific science on that, I, I look up Gregoire Millet's work at a Lausanne. Um, very quickly from an applied perspective, it's about accumulated minutes of hypoxia. And if we look at the number of hours in a week total that you're in natural altitude hypoxic versus perhaps, you know, half of that 70 hours a week or, or more than less than half of it, 70 hours a week that you can accumulate at most in a tent, uh, that does seem to be a major differentiating factor for accumulated, um, uh, hours of, of hypoxia. Um, I have seen tents being used anecdotally effect, uh, in lead-ins to altitude camps to just help with that transition. Uh, I'm aware of some data that might be published soon about using the tent after altitude to help maintain hemoglobin mass re responses a little more. 
to prevent neocytolysis, the, the rupture of red blood cells that happens with drop in EPO. Uh, but again, uh, you know, specific information there is, is hard. The houses are much easier to tolerate because you can just be in there chilling, hanging out, checking an email, you know, making food. A, a tent over a bed, it is really challenging at times to accumulate a lot of time in there. It's doable. Um, and so I, I'm, a, I'm more of a fan of natural altitude. I don't know if that answers that well enough, but. Yeah, and I, I can, I'll just jump, just add that. Like I'm one of the laziest athletes I know and I can't, I can't stand the tent. Like I, there's no way that I personally can stay sane and get those 12 hours a day in there. Um, it, it's just, it's just too difficult in my opinion. So I've done the, the altitude house and that was great. And, and from a you know, perspective of being able to live high and train low, it was great. I had a 7% increase in hemoglobin mass after three weeks. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was achievable and easy to hang out in the house, but yeah, the tents, Personally, just, I can't do it. Cool. Great. And I guess one final question, maybe uh, not directly relevant to today, but kind of the power versus, versus endurance sports. What's your view on it, Trent? Uh, can can um, kind of power strength-based field sport type athletes and sprinters also benefit from altitude? Or we, we, you showed the kind of the cutoff in terms of heat impairment what what do you feel about altitude yeah so first principles are look at the demands of your sport and i think it depends which power-based sport um you know soccer football in a 90-minute game you're going to need a quite of aerobic component and there could be some benefits there in some of the shorter teams power-based team sports um rugby sevens for example which is so short and explosive probably less of a response. Um, that said, I know for a bunch of years, I don't know if it's still happening as much. Uh, a lot of the Aussie AFL teams are using altitude quite, quite a lot. There is a BJSM special edition on team sport and altitude uh, written a few years ago that you could check out on that. Um, uh, I don't work as much with team sports. So uh, again, my, my natural inclination is, um, and the other thing to mention is, there's a training camp effect with all of this stuff. You go to a beautiful place with a bunch of athletes like this. I, I don't, I don't care what the partial pressure of oxygen is. You're going to, you're going you're gonna to bang hard and you're going to come out fit. So uh, I mean, and that's a big problem with some of the altitude research is they don't have that effective sea level control group as well. So um, I'll leave it there just because I'm not as not knowledgeable on, on team sport application and, and yeah. Great. So I think that kind of in broad strokes covers most of the questions. There's a few other ones related more towards heat and cross yeah. adaptation. We'll cross that when, uh, when we get yep. there. So if you want yeah, to more follow the, questions or move on. Yeah, I'll move on to the heat section. If we go a little long, cause these Q and A's are, are awesome. Is that okay, Steven? Yeah, I absolutely. Know whether I should catch us up or okay. Yep. Great. So the next session preparing for heat with an elite endurance athletes. Um, I thought I'd start right away with, uh, you know, you gotta, gotta plug the hosts a little bit here. A great meta-analysis uh, from a few years ago, 96 articles reviewed on heat acclimation. Uh, I think most people would uh, agree and argue that heat acclimation is your number one tool to combat heat. Yes, ice vests and all these other things help, but heat acclimation is 90 to 95% of it. And so this meta-analysis, of course, uh, uh, looked at uh, all the hedges effect sizes. I've put them down there to remind us in medium, large, and very large. And I'll just highlight quickly that, you know, there's a medium to large increase after heat acclimation uh, for performance or performance capacity. There's a decrease in resting and exercise core temp, decrease in skin temp, increase in sweat rates, decrease in resting and exercise heart rates, uh, a medium uh, effect size increase in plasma volume, and decreases in lactate RPE and thermal sensations. All of these things um, with, with pretty decent medium to large effect sizes. I'll highlight though, however, these are the exact adaptations that you can also get from a good endurance training fitness program. And I think one of the really challenging pieces in doing research in this space is teasing out that difference between heat effects versus exercise effects and how you control your control group. Again, there's a lot of heat studies that don't have that um, cool conditions control group. And then when you have that cool conditions control group, do you just clamp it 
to absolute power because then it's way easier than in the heat or do you clamp your control group to some kind of internal load metric where they're going to work way harder, but maybe cardiac stress is the same. You're going to get very different outcomes in those studies. And I think it's important uh, to just highlight that. So again, a, an amazing review here from, from Julian and the team uh, uh, looking at the length of time for heat acclimation across those different adaptations that I've shown. And one of the earliest things to occur is, is over five days, a, a nice robust change in plasma volume here in blue which results in a drop in submaximal heart rate. And that makes sense if you look at cardiac output. Uh, there's later responses that take about two weeks to maximize and that includes sweat rate and to maximize your outcomes on um, exercise capacity. And so again, way back at the start, you'll see we had a very strong recommendation to come into Spain prior to the Doha World Champs for at least 10 days. And then you were gonna leave Spain and, and have at least three or four days in Doha prior to competing to get that full 14 days of heat acclimation. Um, might I suggest that there's a lot of stuff, 80% of what can happen perhaps is in that first five to seven days. And I, I raise a point about minimal effective dose versus prolonged adaptations just with elite athletes. Elite athletes are already nearly maximizing training stress. And I think we need to be careful how much more environmental stress we place on them. Uh, we have to be very careful, just like with altitude on heat acclimation protocols, they do decrease over, overall recovery profile. How do you best integrate them? Where, when, how? There's, I, I don't have time to go into it, but there's, uh, I think, more and more emerging research suggesting, you know, maybe doing a big heat block for seven to 10 days, a month out or a few months out, and then little top-ups leading into a, a taper might be one way to um, get some of the fatigue of the heat camp out of the way, but then maintain those adaptations into a taper. Other things to consider, like the athletes already have very impressive plasma volumes. There's gonna be a ceiling effect at some point. You can only push so much blood into a human. How cool or hot are the projected competitions? There's emerging data about, uh, oh, more than emerging data that, you know, if you increase plasma volume, you'll increase cardiac output. That'll result in an increase in VO2 max, regardless of whether it's hot or cool. And so in cool conditions, there's, there's some strength there around heat acclimation, improving performance as well. And then in the elite athletes, all the specifics around taper and, and travel and jet lag and time in the heat pre-race, all considerations. Um, I'll highlight a paper that we published uh, last year as well, where uh, we did a five-day isothermic uh, um, uh, three group design. So um, groups one and two were in the heat chamber for five days at 36 Celsius for 90 minutes. One group was dehydrated in the heat chamber at a core temp of 38.5. The other group was euhydrated in the chamber, again at a core rate of 38.5. We looked at their cardiac output, which was about in those two groups, they had to exercise at 75% of heart rate max to elicit 38.5 Celsius core temp. We then had a euhydrated control group in a cool environment training, 22 Celsius, but they trained at 75% of heart rate max. So they had to work a lot harder. They had to push more wattage in that cool condition uh, to, to get to the same uh, clamp. So our clamp here across all groups was the same cardiac stress. Here's our three groups, dehydrated heat chamber, euhydrated heat chamber, control group in cool conditions. We had a great team here, uh, all, all at CSI Pacific. And you can see that we did a great job. Everyone uh, working in the chambers and in the lab did a great job in that all three groups worked at about 76 to 78% of heart rate max on average throughout the five days of training. There was significant differences in the percent of wattage required to hit 75% of VO2 max, um, the lowest uh, neuromuscular demand was in the dehydrated group. Um, they got to 75% of the heart rate max really quickly because it's hot and they're dehydrated. The area under the curve for the two heat groups was the same, but significantly greater than the control group. And RPE was the same throughout all three groups, interestingly enough. What do we find? All three groups had the same increase in plasma volume, all three groups had the same improvement in time trial. And so I, I just, I place this here because I, I think at times, and, and at that time, I think there's only three or four heat studies to have a control group and only one or two of them 
um, match for cardiac stress. And <clears throat> I might, I might say that the diff the lack of difference between the groups for plasma volume and TT suggests that you know cardiovascular stress does also absolutely play a role in some of these adaptations. And again, being very careful to differentiate um, heat responses from training cardiac responses um, is impressively difficult to do in our research. Uh, coming up soon, uh, I met Lee Taylor for the first time in Doha. More on that uh, later. Um, uh, but Lee and Sarah Carter and I have uh, just penned an editorial. It's in review right now at BJSM on cooling at Tokyo, the why and how for endurance and team sports. So this is, you know, pre, during and post event cooling. So ice tubs and ice vests and uh, ice towels and slushies and everything else. So stay tuned for that. And by the way, Sarah Carter, uh, amazing job on the infographic in this piece that'll come out soon. So when it comes to heat, obviously we'll use um, technology like the E-Celsius, which has come out and uh, look at core temperature. And, and uh, we, we've done that a lot of times over the years with Evan to create individual profiles. I thought I'd show one from the national championships in Montreal, uh, which was quite a warm day. Uh, off the top of my head, it was about 28 Celsius. It rained at one point in the race, so humidity was through the roof. And we implemented an ice bath uh, uh, there just as one of the first times that Evan had used an ice bath, again, to practice that before a world championship. This is his warm up core temperature. He got into the ice tub and you can see a nice drop creating that heat sink that we're hoping to get um, coming out of, um, out of the ice bath. This is the 20 K walk. The plan there was through about 12 or 13 K was to go at Canadian record pace in the heat. So he really pushed it. This is his um, heart rate average or, or, current heart rate smooth or, or this is just his heart rate and at about 15k or 13k he kind of shut it down because that was again the plan he was he was well on the lead he's a dominant athlete and you can see actually uh, a nice coupling between heart rate intensity and, and even a drop in core temp uh, uh, without or throughout the race and so obviously you know the duration is the longest here and the dehydration is the greatest here in the race but the highest core temperatures were always associated with with the most or the highest exercise intensity. So you know we'll go through and analyze this, look at RPEs, look at speed, uh, look at uh, all these types of relationships to create a profile. At the holding camp in Spain, so when Evan had arrived from St. Moritz, uh, I was there. Uh, um, we had our other physiologist Gareth up in uh, up in St. Moritz, and we would go through some various workouts. This is a massive workout, eight times three k. Uh, done peak afternoon, 130, 28 Celsius, 55% um, humidity. We had the core temperature pills. Um, about every 10 minutes, I was going through RPEs. We had speed. Uh, I've, I've blinded it here. It's just, it's Evan's data. He's pretty open with it. But I would generate a report. Uh, what are the RPE to speed to core temperature to heart rate relationships? What do they look like? How is he managing it? You know, uh, you know, this is 38 and a half Celsius. This is a key cutoff for heat acclimation. You can see he, holy smokes, he spent almost two hours over 38 and a half Celsius in, in this type of a workout. We look at percent of heart rate max or some of his um, uh, outcomes as well. So that we're just giving him more and more clues and more and more data for him to better titrate out his pacing and his responses uh, in the heat. Uh, Again, this is an outstanding paper by, by Stephen and, and the late, great Gord Sleevert. Uh, Gord was one of our performance directors here at CSI Pacific and unfortunately passed away uh, a few years ago, an absolute legend in the heat field. And I want to just r really stress that for endurance athlete, pace judgment and pace adju uh, adjustments is essential. And any time you have an intervention that's going to change RPE or fatigue, it is going to impact pacing. So things that change RPE include things like pre and during cooling, include things like caffeine or carbohydrate or in event cooling or heat acclimation. And so it's really important to mimic the demands of the event and race to really allow the athlete to sense their RPE along with pace and their other, uh, other cues that they use for effective pacing. Uh, leading into DOA, I certainly did a lot of homework with some of our um, mathematicians and uh, some of our um, uh, statistician, we don't mathematicians, statisticians and, and performance analysis folks at CSI Pacific. 
you know, pulling paper like Ellie et al. and some of their marathon paper and looking at like, what is the performance decrements? What is the published research on wet blow uh, on how much performance decrements occur across time and different temperatures? Um, there's actually not a lot of elite, elite data out there in this space. And given the amount of data in the public domain now, I, there's probably some projects there that are um, quite doable uh, with just public domain data. And so uh, this section was a little bit shorter. Um, again, uh, I'll pause there and, and uh, ask uh, Evan a question, just kick this off and we'll do another short um, Q and A here on the heat part before we wrap up. And, you know, Evan, I know that um, your coach, uh, Jerry, initially started some of your heat work with uh, the late great Gord Sleever. Um, you know, I, I can't remember if you were directly involved in that time or not, but do you have any great legacy pieces from that? I, I know there's a lot of people in Canada listening who um, really respected what Gord, uh, Gord was able to bring to the field. And yeah. Maybe you don't, so. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we, the first time I was in the heat chamber in Victoria was in 2010 when we were preparing for Commonwealth Games, and uh, I just, I mean, I remember that as just being the most fun thing ever. Like just this idea of getting to be a guinea pig and <laughs> and try out these new things. And um, it was it was so much fun. It was so cool. And um, it never worked the way we wanted it to. One, of, It was myself and Yaki Gomez and, and Creighton Connolly, one of our teammates back then. And his sweat rate was like two and a half liters. Of, it, was, it was insane. And it was, we'd be then in there for about five minutes and the humidity would be up at a hundred percent. And We'd all be, we'd all be, you know, um, James Brotherhood was, uh, was at CSI at the time. And then he'd come in and he'd sit. We this the, the amount of laughs we had in that, in that tiny little chamber, three of us, you know, two on a treadmill, one on a bike uh, for 90 minutes, just, you know, hanging out, getting the, getting the work done and, and, and you know, building that heat stress. It was just, yeah, such a fun time and <laughs> looking back on it. And again, just that ragtag, you know, trailer out in the parking lot of, of CSI. And um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of good memories. Yeah. Yeah, we have an ugly looking trailer out front of our institute, but it, it, it's actually a decently sophisticated heat chamber. And uh, again, it's Gord's ingenuity is, well, if I can't put in a heat chamber in the institute, we'll just build it in a trailer. So it was great. Stephen, I'll pass it over to you. If there's any uh, Q&A, um, we can do that now on heat and then we'll, we'll wrap up at the end as well. Sure. I guess the kind of one theme of the questions, Evan, is... Uh, and we touched on it earlier with the altitude, but you know, through your you know quite long career now, how do you how have you kind of um, felt kind of both at heat and altitude, kind of when you were a younger athlete versus now? Do you feel you know, for example, that you adapt the heat quicker, better? Do you feel more comfortable in the heat now than compared to when you were young? Can you kind of reflect on both that and with the altitude piece? Yeah, with the heat stuff, I a lot of it stems from just respect for for the for heat. Um, I don't think there's anything special about my ability to perform well in the heat, and um, I think we'll talk about this a little bit once we get into the actual putting it all together for the Doha race. But um, you know, I don't. I, I'm a I'm a pretty tall athlete. I'm not the I'm 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 certainly thin, but I'm not anywhere near the smallest athlete um, in the race. I'm probably on the bigger side of it actually. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything special about me that, that allows me to, um, you know, to, to perform really well in the heat, except for the fact that we listen to, you know, listen to everything Trent says and, and stay on top Love of just me. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and Jerry stays on top of the research and, and, and we build these things in. So, you know, just the, the trial and error and, and being will, willing to experiment with things and, and, you know, see what works and, and, um, you know, just for example, um, Trent showed the data from the race in Montreal, the national championships where we tried the ice bath for the first time. And that was a simple thing of, okay, well, we want to do this in Doha. So we're going to do it now and see how it all works. And the littlest thing of, okay, I did a full submersion ice bath, including my feet. I have really calloused feet. We got out there for the race and my, you know, my feet had gotten so wet and, and um, so soft that the first 5k of the race, I couldn't feel my feet and, and, and was telling Jerry, like, I don't know if I can race. Like, I don't know if I can keep going. I, I, you know, I can't feel what's happening in my feet. And, and so we adjusted that and come Doha, we, you know, Trent has a picture of me somewhat trying to stay in the ice bath, fully submerged, but keeping my feet out and, and, you know, just a little tiny adjustment like that of, 
um, you know, taking what we learn each time and building upon it. I think that's probably what our biggest advantage is of, of you know, throwing away what doesn't work, keeping what does work, and then always trying to add little pieces onto it and, and build up. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll touch a little bit more specifically on, on what worked for Doha, but that's sort of the, the general theme that we take on is just throw away what doesn't work, keep what works and, and keep building. And then do you feel yourself kind of a uh, unique among your peers in, in race walking in terms of you sound very open to science and really being kind of uh, willing to adapt and, and change things based on science. Do you feel kind of given your background, you have a undergrad in kinesiology itself. Do you feel that makes you kind of somewhat unique and an advantage for you as a competitor? I think there's a big, there's a big group of us, and especially this group that goes and trains in Australia with the supernova group. And, um, you know, the, the, the two dozen of us or so, I think are a lot more open to this stuff because, um, you know, how invested we are and how involved we are with science. Um, so I think within race walking, I'm in a subset that, that pays more attention to it and is more um, on the ball with it. I think in general, race walking is probably ahead of the curve than, than the marathon runners are. Um, one is opportunity, especially when we're talking about fueling and cooling. We race on a two kilometer loop, so we have way more opportunity um, to, um, you know, to experiment with things and, and to get our fueling in and all that sort of stuff. So I think we've always been a bit ahead of the curve there. Also because we're willing to gather in groups of 20 from 12 different countries to do research, we're ahead of the research because we are the research. Um, and I think that really helps as well. So, um, I think, yeah, within, within race walking, I'm, I'm, I think there's a, a number of us, you know, a dozen, two dozen of us that, that really pay attention to that. And you can see that from the race. If you watch the race in Doha and you watch the marathon and you look at the difference between them, um, you know, especially the women's marathon and the next night, the men's 50 or the men's and women's 50 Ks, the amount of the race walkers who were, um, you know, just dousing themselves in water and putting on wearing cooling units around their neck or, or anything like that. It's night and day difference between um, what we saw in the marathon and what we saw in the race walk. So um, yeah, I think that answers that. Great. And then uh, kind of question more for you, Trent. Um, what's your experience with, obviously if you can't use core temperature, whether with pills or anything else, like how do you, check for heat adaptation how do you monitor heat adaptation yeah so um continued drops in in submaximal heart rate at a set intensity in rel in the same relative temperature can be a really nice indicator of heat acclimation um sometimes the drops at slightly higher aerobic levels can be as much as 20 or 30 beats in 10 to 15 days and uh, just being careful on that one and that might just be a standardized warm-up that you're just doing every day just with a heart rate that's at the exact same speed or wattage. Uh, hopefully the day-to-day -day temperatures stay relatively the same in your camp, but that, that's one way that that can be done um, uh, relatively easy. And then uh, kind of one final catch-up question with altitude and related to the iron supplementation. There's a couple of questions I'll merge them together. Um, What's your experience with kind of different forms of iron, whether it's liquid or, or gels or pills, and also in terms of co-ingestion with, you know, orange juice or vitamin C? Yeah, so in that, um, that Sportsman Nutrition paper, we spend a, a fair amount of time looking at all the impactors of iron bioavailability. For sure, vitamin C <clears throat> seems to help with that calcium and tannins will block it, uh, where you place your iron supplement in relation to um, hepcidin release from exercise or circadian rhythm, uh, all impacts on, on uh, iron bioavailability. Um, we've tended to stick with just tried and true iron salts here. Uh, we have a brand Palifer that seems to be well tolerated, um, uh, ferrous fumarate. Um, and uh, some of the heme-based irons I've, uh, that have lower levels of total elemental iron uh, we've, we've had mixed results on, to be honest. Um, uh, I, I do think driving in those levels of elemental iron that are required are, are key. Uh, that said, uh, you know, I have a couple of publications in iron and I'm a bit out of my scope there. And um, if, if Pete Peeling was on, he would knock this out of the park. So, yeah. Okay, great. I'll let cool. you and, and Evan up. Yeah. Anyone? All right. So this last section, um, there's a little bit here on combining heat and altitude. More is better. 
and then we'll bring it, I'll go right into the uh, last DOA piece. And I thought I'd, I'd pull out this first paper that just came out uh, in 2017, looking at combined heat and hypoxia out of the AIS with uh, you know, some great usual suspects down there at the bottom in terms of authors. They took 26 athletes and split them into three conditions. One was a heat and hypoxia condition, group one. One was heat training with no hypoxia, so hot only, and one was a control group, so no heat and no hypoxia. Um, I'll highlight that the changes in hemoglobin mass only occurred with the heat and hypoxia group post, while the heat only group and the control group did not get changes in hemoglobin mass, and th that fits, that makes sense. They, they weren't exposed to hypoxia. Interestingly though, the only group that showed the shift and increase in plasma volume was the hot only group. The, the group that got uh, heat and hypoxia showed no change in hemoglobin mass or in plasma volume, excuse me. When it came to the performance outcomes, again, immediately post, only the hot group saw, saw the faster or improvement in performance uh, post and immediately three weeks post. The group that used the combined heat and hypoxia actually had very little changes to their outcomes in time trial performance, which are pretty similar to the control group. This paper was followed up with another paper, so I'll just, I'll just read the title, Impaired Heat Adaptation from Combining Heat Training and Live High Train Low. And so uh, with that, you know, there's thoughts that there might be synergies with chronic heat and red blood cells though, like this paper just came out this week. Four, five weeks of heat training increases hemoglobin mass. That followed up from a paper last year that showed a similar outcome. Prolonged heat training might actually increase hemoglobin mass. Uh, from excellent groups, excellent papers. But interestingly enough, um, again, I just pulled this off of Twitter this week, you know, Seb replied, intriguing, we, you know, they saw a decrease in hemoglobin mass with heat. You know, I mentioned our lab, we haven't published it, also seemed to show a smaller decrease on the limit of detection of hemoglobin mass over some of our shorter duration camps. Ollie replied and said, huh, in these papers, we found no change in hemoglobin mass with heat. So I think the jury's still very much out. And I think my take home message here is that our understanding of adaptive cross tolerance <laughs> in complex in vitro practical situations is, is really quite poorly understood and needs a lot of uh, development. So I know this is a simple picture, but when it comes to heat and altitude and tapering and endurance performance and all the stimuli that we're adding onto an athlete, what we're trying to really do is have them arrive at the Olympics or Paralympics or the major championship as a nice yellow, ripe, well-tapered, high-performing, delicious banana. We don't want to have them under-trained here in green banana, and we don't want them overcooked. And I think one thing that we can fall into a trap of at times is that and I showed this meta-analysis earlier, is like heat will improve performance. Endurance will improve performance. But then there's a paper like this. Impairment of cycling capacity in the heat in well-trained endurance athletes after high-intensity short-term heat acclimation. In short, elite athletes are already on the extreme of training. When you layer in high-intensity or high-environmental stress, you can very easily tip them into the brown banana state. And, and I, I, I just, I say that is it, it is really easy to overdo all the stimuli and you got to find a balance with all of it. So given some of that earlier data, you know, we recommended athletes use altitude, but then we recommended sequentially to come in and use heat and then go into, into DOA with ex exceptional monitoring throughout that whole process so that, in the training camp, you know, we're, I'm okay with brown bananas in a training block, but we want those brown bananas to <laughs> come back into yellow when it's time to perform. So putting it all together, first of all, I think knowing what you're going into is really important. I was able to take a reconnaissance trip, a field trip, uh, to go speak at this conference, the International Conference on Medicine and Science and Sport, put on by Aspatire and Aspire in May of 2019. So I was able to meet with everyone there. I spoke at the conference. I mean, this is um, one of the world for foremost experts on, on, on heat stress and, and heat stroke, Doug Cass and I hanging out at, at the Doha Diamond League. You know, I, I had my little weather station. I was looking at temperatures outside. 
the indoor track at Doha was air conditioned. It was about 22 to 24 Celsius indoors. I had pants on at that meet, despite it being 32 Celsius uh, outdoors. What else? Venue mapping and info gathering. Where are the sunspots on the stadium? In this world championship, that didn't matter because everything was at night. But as a field event athlete in Tokyo, if you're a shot putter, oh, well, you know, a shot put's easy. They're not going to have heat problem. These are big athletes who might be directly in the sun for three hours during qualifying. You got to think out, outside the box. Uh, these are pictures that I took in terms of the cold tubs we could access prior to the races. Uh, this, this was at the road course. How long are the steps between the warm up area and the track? Do we have access to ice or don't we? Uh, what about ice tubs out in the field on the warm up track? Again, the LOC was exceptional here, the local organizing committee and providing everything we needed. When it comes to the Olympics and Paralympics, we really rely on our Canadian Olympic Committee and Paralympic committees. And over the years, they've been exceptional at really providing us sports with this infrastructure, access to ice when we need it. Um, I'm always banging on the door. I need a, you know, freezer space for my ice vest. Like where, where can I go? That infrastructure needs to be in place. We do a lot of analysis and look at every single um, race course. So this is the road course for the marathon and, and for the race walk. And you can see it's a, it's a concave course. So what are the typical temps and winds at 1130 and midnight? That's when the road races occurred. The local organizing committee found the coolest time. Uh, I didn't get back to the hotel till 6 a.m. after the race walk. Uh, what's the location of aid tables? Are they left or right-handed? That makes a difference to athletes. Are they off tangent? How much does the athlete need to go off tangent to pick up their own bottles to come back on tangent? Um, Evan and I have known each other long enough. We had a little bit of a spat and a marital in the middle of the 50K because he kept going off tangent too early to get his bottle. And like at one point, I actually took a picture so I could show him after the race. He corrected it, but I was just like, God, we, he doesn't need to rock 51K tonight. We just need 50. <laughs> Uh, what are the staff permissions, accreditations, access to water, ice, pre-event change tents, et cetera, et cetera. You do your homework. Pollution. Uh, Doha is a polluted place. I won't go into it too much other than there were great talks last week from Pascal and Mike. But I know Mike well. We co-supervise actually Gareth Stanford's postdoc right now. And I could reach out to my network. And we emailed Mike. And Mike was our remote expert on pollution to help us kind of work through some of those mitigating factors. There is a huge amount of behind the scenes prep that pulls off a road race, either race walking or the marathon. Um, here's our stuff here on the left, two full coolers, multiple suitcases. This is the Japanese and the Chinese. Um, there is a lot of work. This is the, this is an Evan. This is our women's marathon group getting ready in, um, in my hotel room uh, with our physician there in the background. You can see all the bottles. They all need to be individually labeled because um, every athlete has their own hydration and fueling plan. We have to get those bottles out in the right sequence at the right time. We have ice vests that we need to keep cold on ice. We need to have these uh, bottles on ice the day before. We're looking you know, at all our monitoring. I have a little weigh scale to measure bottles. Um, we, we do try to nail this for the athletes. Uh, here, Lindsay's you know, cutting towels to make in-race um, towel prep so we can put ice in there and they can wear that around their neck for neck cooling. And indeed, our cooling strategies were, um, uh, were robust. I, we had a lot of the athletes absolutely opt in. Most of the track athletes wore ice vests, as you can see here from some of our female uh, steeplechasers. Uh, Evan, again, we learned from Montreal. Uh, you can see he's in his uh, pre-event cold tub. So this is, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes before the uh, 50K. I took a photo. Uh, where, uh, that's about a 12, 13 Celsius cold tub. He was in for about 10 minutes. We try to bring him just down to shivering. We don't want him to shiver because then he's trying to generate heat. Uh, and so um, we have his core temp pretty much in there, but his, his legs and feet out to keep them dry. Evan has a progressive and developed fueling plan. Uh, we actually get this on a spreadsheet. And every single loop, he's you know mixing and matching different types of carbohydrate sources and caffeine sources. Um, in general, he's a type of guy that's adapted his gut to about 80 grams an hour in carbohydrate. And in this race, he was uh, close to um, uh, uh, over a liter an hour of fluids, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, again, uh, this is you know, well-practiced and dialed in, and uh, we could probably do a 90-minute chat just on this piece. But Evan took 
uh, stopped at 74 different drink stations. That Those weren't all his personal stations because he only gets that once every 2K, but with all the other aid stations on the course, he uh, a lot of times it was just for personal cooling. Race execution and pacing. Here is the top six athletes and their pace in minutes per kilometer across the 50K. You can see Suzuki from Japan who won, who was aggressive right off the start with some of his teammates who then wiltered and dropped out or, or fell way off the pace. And he did an impressive job, although he was slowing down over this last 10K. If we zoom in here, the green line is Evan. And he, he by far had the most impressive last five or 10K of the race and came within three seconds of silver. And, you know, we had a lot of conversations on pacing before the race, a lot of analysis. And in fact, part of our analysis was on the women's um, marathon the night before. And Brett Balance uh, had a nice analysis. I had my own analysis because we wanted to see the response of the women the night before to learn from it. One of the kickers was the night before, it was 32 Celsius and 75% humidity during race time at midnight. And during the men's 50K in the last hour, it actually cooled off for Evan a little bit. I don't know if you sensed it, I did. Uh, it got down to about 65 or 70% humidity and was down to 28 Celsius. And so I look at this, I'm really proud of the bronze. Evan executed so well. He, his control and temperament early on was as best as I've ever seen in his career in terms of pacing. It was, it was so awesome. But part of me is like, ah, man, we should have let him loose a little earlier because we could have got that silver medal. Um, and that maybe we were a little too conservative uh, uh, on the pacing bit. Um, to put it in perspective, uh, Evan was 9% slower than his Canadian record or 25 minutes, about 25 minutes slower than his Canadian record uh, in the heat to get bronze. Evan right away, the scientist he is, uh, the IAAF and World Athletics through Sebastian uh, and their crew and Lee Taylor were running a study so we could get the core temps quite quickly. Here's Evan's uh, core temps in orange throughout the race, along with his heart rate. Again, a nice matching of cardiac stress to, to core temp and his splits here in blue. And yes, you can see he did get up to 40 Celsius, but we had seen that before uh, in, in our monitoring of Evan. And we knew that generally in terms of heart rate, if he stayed at, at or close to threshold in these types of conditions, that his core temp would, would creep, but still stay under that 39 Celsius and a tolerable level for Evan. And of course, uh, you know, he was well over heart rate thresholds here as he was kicking for home and going through the field and, uh, man, what an exciting last 10K. Evan's tweet after the race uh, is here. Uh, I'll just say at the bottom, standing on the start line, I'm not the most genetically gifted, but these conditions are a great equalizer. And, and what, a, what an interesting and great and positive and well-prepared post compared to things like Doha World Championship, a disaster. As I sit up front, everyone knew five years in advance it was to be hot. And I, I did some analysis. This was no hotter than the, than the um, uh, Ironman World Champs in Hawaii. It was no hotter than the LA 84 Marathon. It was no hotter uh, necessarily than um, um, uh, Atlanta in, in terms of the heat they had in that Olympics. You just need to prepare properly. And statistically, this was actually the best performance world championships that the IAAF ever had. So it's an interesting um, juxtaposition. And of course, an amazing um, bronze medal. I asked Evan afterwards, and I was right there. I was able to take these photos, you know, what this meant to him. And his teammates is what he mentioned right away. Ben, one of his teammates, myself and Anaki. Anaki is now the big wig at IAAF as a um, athlete rep. I, I told him when he's the IOC president someday, hopefully he'll remember us. I'm serious. Uh, we were all training partners. And we all won team challenges, but this medal is as much theirs as mine. My coach Jerry and I have been together now for 20 years. It's just so nice to get here, finally to get on the podium. And yeah, you know, I still get a little choked up here seeing Evan's responses. He's not crying from the 50Ks. He's, he's crying from being with his friends. So what did I learn? Coach and athlete are completely open and receptive to sports science. Learning mindset around performance optimization. This is why it worked. Experienced athlete in the heat multiple times over to work with and time to work with individual profiling with him. Receptive to feedback on pacing adjustments required in different weather conditions. 
So we actually didn't really totally land on, on, on the plan or Evan didn't with his coach until literally we knew what we were facing on that day. Fueling hydration protocol that was progressive and well-practiced. Access to fridge ice at the hotel, as well as cool tubs at the venue. These are infrastructure pieces that aren't always there for us that are really challenging. And an athlete that is now consistently proven they can execute. It's fine to do all this stuff, but you need someone who can come in, be calm, uh, 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 st still have the um, excitement of the race, but perform under pressure. So I'll stop there. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is just do my acknowledgements quick, and then we'll, we'll stop and do Q&A until we run out of time. I, it's really important I make some acknowledgements here. First of all, all these folks in Doha, Qatar, creating a network. If you're a young sports scientist, just create a network. All of these people were essential to what we did there and were behind the scenes people that helped me personally. Um, Juan Manuel, I've known him as a physician for 20 years. Here's, here's you know, him in Rio with my wife and I and, and, and Lee Taylor. Like, here's a guy helping us and helping Evan cool down after the race. Evan, you don't even probably remember this guy, but Lee was like in our back pocket. He was our little commando guy there for us. Obviously, CSI Pacific and, and Gord, I, I dedicate this talk to Gord. Uh, he should be doing this talk, not me. All the collaborators and many, many more. I wanna just always highlight them. Your name's on there. All the funders. And then finally, like the athletes and coaches and Evan, they're without um, the trust that I have with them and the, and the gratitude and the, and the, and the outcomes, um, this stuff doesn't happen. So I will uh, stop there. Um, and maybe we can then ask Evan about his uh, 2019 Doe experience. The, the questions today were so much. We've went a little bit over, a little longer than I thought. But um, Stephen, I'm available uh, for a while and you can just cut us off when you want to. And uh, thank you everyone for, for listening and we can take Q&A. Perfect. Thank you so much for leading that, Trent. And yeah, Evan, obviously Trent brought talked about kind of all the planning that they did as sports scientists. Maybe we can start with at what point kind of were you brought into the picture of things such as here's the wind conditions, here's kind of all of these, uh, here's the aid station. At what point were you as the athlete and coach kind of integrated into that kind of planning or was it right from day one? Yeah, I think there, there's a lot that sort of, um, you know, goes on parallel you know Trent's Trent's got his in, in his lane getting gathering his information I'm in my lane gathering my information and then you know for us it was really in in Barcelona and then going to Doha that we sort of sat down and said okay here's what I'm bringing to the table here's what I'm bringing to the table um you know what's your plan and and, and Trent's very you know Trent has that trust in, in our group now that it's he can sit back and say what's your plan and and then okay here's all I can build into that and and um, you know, there's usually not much difference now these days between, um, you know, what, what we're going and thinking and, and, and um, you know, how we need to adjust after, after sitting, with, sitting down and talking to Trent. So, I mean, I think that's a huge um, uh, compliment into, into how we've sort of grown into this role. And, and over the years, it's taken us a long time to get here. But um, you know, Doha was very, as Trent said, we knew it was going to be hot. We knew... I remember sitting in St. Moritz with my teammates, um, Percy Carlstrom, who actually just texted me when Trent was reading that quote. Um, I got a text from him saying, oh, now I'm crying. Because um, it, is, it is very emotional. I mean, I was getting, I was getting choked up a little bit too. It's, it's, you know, you put so much into this and uh, your teammates around you, um, you know, are, are, are so much a part of it. So Percy from, from Sweden, uh, who won, ended up winning bronze in the 20K walk a few days later, and myself and, and Quentin Rue were training together in um in St. Moritz and, and we were we talked about it all the time we said it's gonna be hot it's gonna be it's gonna, it's gonna be ridiculous it's gonna be unlike anything we've ever experienced um and and we're gonna do well in it because we know you know we we know what to expect we saw we saw other athletes just as Trent said you know that com sometimes combining altitude and heat isn't great and we saw athletes training in you know Sierra Nevada really hammering it out and thinking well what, oh yeah, that's silly why are they doing that okay look, we, we got those guys beat and you know, we saw athletes coming into Doha complaining on social media about how hot it was and how hard the conditions were going to be. Like, okay, perfect. We're, we got those guys beat. And, and just using the conditions to our advantage and using it as a, um, a confidence builder to say, okay, well, we know that we're prepared and, 
Um, we knew that we were building on things. I, for me personally, I think I did a lot right with preparing for the heat, but I also know there's things I hadn't, uh, that I hadn't integrated yet. There's stuff, there's still more that I can do that we were planning on doing for Tokyo and still planning to do for Tokyo. Um, that, you know, hyperhydration and, and all sorts of other stuff that just hadn't had enough time to perfect and weren't confident enough that we could execute with it on the day at world champ. So we left it out and we stuck with what we knew works and, uh, I get a little bit bugged by that Canadian running article that says I stopped at 70 whatever drink stations because uh, it makes me think of a race, that's a quick anecdote. In 2015, Trent was on my drinks table at World Champs in Beijing and I was completely dying in the last UK and I came by and I just stopped at the drinks table and Aki and Trent were on the drinks table. I just stopped and I said, give me some Coke and, and, <laughs> and grabbed my bottle of Coke and just stood there for 15 seconds and, and gathered myself and I remember coming and then I read you the riot act to get going the next lap Trent saying I'm about 30 meters away and Trent yelling at me you better not stop this time uh, da, da, you keep going straight through there da, da. and it just scared the crap out of me um so it bugs bugged me because but but um you know those drink Doha was you know as prepared as we were for the conditions Doha also provided us all these amazing opportunities to do stuff like we'd never done before on a two kilometer loop, having, having four drinks tables, essentially, um, two of them were, were side by side. So essentially we had drinks tables every 600 meters. And I was able to grab ice cold bottles of water for four hours. You know, those bottles weren't sitting out there in the, in, in the heat, they weren't getting warmer. They were ice cold the entire time. Um, you know, just the opportunity that we were given, it was silly not to take it. And um, as, I, as I think I, I worked out at the race, I think I poured about a hundred liters of water um, over myself during the race just to stay cool and um, it, it, so much of it came down to confidence I think so much of it came down to trusting in what we were doing knowing from the women's race the night before that that eight to ten percent reduction in pace was going to be what it took uh, in the month leading into world champs I had done I think six 50ks in training in St. Moritz or sorry 40ks in training um, so six 40ks all of which were faster than what I went through the world champs 40k split in. So, you know, we were going off at a pace that was slower than our training pace. And it takes a lot of confidence and trust that that's okay. That that's part of what's going to pay off in the end. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I, I think the large part of what, was successful in Doha was simply just doing what we knew, doing what we had trained and then trusting in the process. And um, I wasn't very confident going into this race with my fitness. I didn't, I'd gotten my ass kicked in a lot of my 50 Ks in the last couple of years, basically since Rio. And um, my goal wasn't to win a medal. My goal wasn't to, you know, to, yeah, to stand on that podium. My goal was to beat the 50 K. I wanted to have a race where I finished strongly and didn't blow up and didn't, feel like this race was beyond me. I wanted to finish, you know, finish a race there. I thought, okay, yes, I, I beat you 50 K good. And it wasn't until the last 10 K that was like, Oh crap, actually, if I, you know, if I, if I play my cards, right, there's, there could be a medal in this for me. Um, so, you know, looking back on that, there's maybe things we could have done differently that could have put us in a position to be fighting for gold rather than bronze. But, um, but, you know, again, I think that respect for the event, was part of the whole process as well. You know, respect for the conditions, respect for the event, and um, you know, respecting the process. I think were the key elements that that brought us success. So no, that's wonderful. Oh, and I think that really highlights the importance of that entire support team, you know, and that trust between the athlete, the coaches, the support team. And that's really a wonderful message to hear that it's not just something you can just throw together. It's years and years of building that trust and that confidence. Um, one question we had here was when you did kind of adjust your pacing strategy, both kind of for the first 40 K let's say where it was a reduced pacing. And then when you sped up, was it, um, was it cadence? Was it stride length? Like what, what was what changed in terms of the pacing and how did you adjust yeah usually um usually late in a race um you know one fatigue is already set in you're, you're focusing on cadence you're focusing on keeping the cadence high in this instance it would have been a combination of cadence and stride length um you know i went from 
I think I went through 40 K in about three hours and 19 minutes. Something like that. So just under five minute clump, five minutes per K. Um, whereas my last 10 K was covered in about 46 minutes. So 436 and, um, per kilometer. So, um, you know, my last kilometer was 411, whereas my average pace for the whole race was 454. So there's, there's a, only so much you can increase cadence to get that kind of change. Um, so it would have been a combination of both, but mostly it was just the, the patience of waiting until that 36K, 38K, 40K mark to say, okay, things haven't gone terribly wrong yet. I can probably start to slowly accelerate, slowly accelerate. There was, there was one instance in the race, there was an athlete who went from about 25K, dropped to 436. Um, you know, a, a pace that is pretty normal. It's, it's, it, that's the average pace that it takes to get the Olympic standard. You know, it's, it's not without side of the realm of possibility for all these athletes. He went from like 25th spot up to like second in two kilometers with these splits that weren't crazy, but considering the conditions were crazy. And five kilometers later, he was walking six minute Ks and was out the back. Like we knew a tiny bit of over adjustment too early was going to come back and kick you, in, kick you in the ass in those last couple of kilometers. So um, we had to be really careful and really make sure that once, once we made that acceleration for home, that I was going to be able to hold it all the way home. Super. A um, couple of other questions I have here. Um, when you had the kind of uh, the drinks, were, was it kind of uh, ice cold or do you prefer a kind of a slightly less cold temperature? And Trent, was there a difference between the water kind of temperature that he was pouring on his head versus what he was drinking? Can you kind of shed some insight into that? Yeah, the, the bottles along the course, so the, the non-personal drinks tables, which we had three of, um, were just um, bottles of water and sponges. And those were ice cold. They were 250 mil bottles until about the last 5, 10K. And then all of a sudden, we had 500 mil bottles show up. But um, they ran out. what I was doing was grabbing, um, grabbing two bottles, two sponges. I would hold the bottles in one hand, sponge myself off, um, throw that sponge away, put the other sponge in my shorts to, to sponge myself off 300 meters down the line, pour one of the bottles on myself, maybe take a quick swig of water, spit it out, hold the other bottle for a couple hundred meters, then open it, pour it on myself, take the other sponge, use it to sponge off. So literally I was never going more than two minutes without cooling in some way, shape or form. And especially with the humidity in, in Doha being the real kicker, like we knew skin temp, keeping skin temp down was going to be so important in that perception of heat. And I think the biggest compliment I, or the biggest thing I took away from the race was I never once felt hot. There was never once a feeling of, Oh, this is, this is really, really tough. It was okay. Every time there was that even slightest sensation of like, Oh, it's getting warm. There was a drinks table there and I was being able to cool off. And the drinks I drank it from, from the drink personal table that Trent was manning. Um, we had those on in coolers on ice um, everything from, I was changing hats every, every lap, um, to a nice, to a new ice cold hat, um, with an, with an ice scarf that we made out of, um, women's pantyhose that we had bought the day before at the superstore. So both bill of ice, ice, ta a towel that was soaked in ice around my neck and then grab the bottles from Trent and, and swig those down. So, uh, it was a really good system. That's kind of, you know, it was kind of very Canadian and it's hodgepodgeness of, of how we did it. The, the Japanese had special hats that had air vents in them and gl like gloves that had ice packs in them and, and just this you know very Japanese in in how far along they were technologically and we were just piecing together um ice stuff in pantyhose yeah but it's, it worked uh, it definitely is a Canadian tradition given the uh, chambers that Gord and I have built in the past with uh doing our various heat studies and our duct tape science but it it's highly effective um <laughs> Kind of maybe the final question for you, Evan, um, and maybe Trent too, if you can shed light on it. Obviously now the big buildup is for Tokyo 2021. And however, you know, it looks like all of 2020 is going to be heavily impacted in terms of your ability to go to altitude of doing heat camps and stuff. So, you know, kind of, you might be in a sense, you're still training, but you're not getting kind of that top up of these things that you know have worked. So 
how are you looking at kind of adjusting your build up, your schedule kind of for 2021, assuming everything is going to proceed as normal in 2021? What's the impact essentially of missing kind of that, uh, that elite training as opposed to your kind of your everyday training? Yeah, the, the best example sort of that you know, I can take away that gives me confidence that it's going to be fine was in 2018, uh, our season shut down in May. We had um, uh, Commonwealth Games were, uh, were in April that year. Um, so there's really no big race blocking season after our World Team Champs in May. Um, so I went from May 2018 all through, you know, all through the year. And then with 2019 World Champs being so late in the year, everything was pushed back. So, you know, I pretty much went that entire year without doing um, altitude or, or heat stuff. And then 2019 worked out just fine. So, um, you know, for me, just at, at, on the athlete side of things, just it's, it's confidence, right? So I can just say, okay, well, this is no different than, than 2018, 2019. It's just, you know, so, and I know it worked then. So I can have confidence that we can get things back together, hopefully head to Australia, um, you know, in January, February and, and get back into our normal routine and, and we wouldn't have missed a beat. Um, so Trent probably has some more insightful. <laughs> take you on know, that. it, it, it's, um, every single athlete's in a different trajectory given their event and what they normally do for their event in athletics, because they're all so different and without getting it massively into the nitty gritty, it's make plan a, make plan B, make plan C, make plan D. So plan, but just more than ever do it in pencil and then get your head wrapped around um, the concept that we're going to have to adapt and be adaptable but we have all these plans and we've got a great team around you to execute all those plans, maybe better than other teams around the world. We have lots of experience in adapting and, and no matter what comes at us, we're, we're going to have a plan and we're going to work on the plan with your input, with your coach's input, with everyone's input to make the best plan. And um, there's, there's a lot of unknowns. I, I don't have the answers like, but we're, we'll be ready when we, when we need to be ready. Super. Any, um, any closing statements or any closing thoughts from either Trent or Evan? Trent? Yeah, uh, thanks so much for having us on. Uh, thanks for everyone who, who stayed long. I know we went over, but uh, I think the Q&As with Evan were way more receptive than well, I knew they'd be great. But uh, so thanks for all the questions in the background. And um, this is a fun session. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just honored to, to get to share the the screen with uh, with Trent. Um, oh come on! <laughs> I, I, I yeah, I'm. This is really cool for me. This is the you know for uh, to be able to do this and be able to talk to uh, you know in this forum. Uh, it, it means a lot to me. So I you know thank you guys so much for the opportunity. And Trent, thanks for thinking of me to to add value to this. And um, it's it's been yeah really really fun for me. Well, great. I want to thank both Trent and Evan for what I think has just been a stellar session um, and I especially appreciate both Evan and Trent's willingness to share kind of their insights and you know it's very rare that we have an elite athlete who is willing to really talk about their experiences talk about their training so much of the time it's treated as as a state secrets locked up in Fort Knox that we don't really get to see this so I, I think all of us have had brilliant insight into an elite performance, what it takes from the athlete, what it takes from the support staff and the entire team. So I think there's a lot of lessons learned for those of us who want to work in applied sports and also who want to work with, with athletes to improve performance. So again, I want to thank both Trent and Evan for their time. And again, we will have this for those of you or those of friends who may have missed this session. We will have this up on our ICWE 2021 website, hopefully by the end of today, Thursday. And the, the upcoming talks are going to be you know, along this theme. Again, next week, we're going to have cold. We're going to have both the, the theoretical aspect of exercise in the cold and also looking at the really applied perspective. And again, as a, as a ad, the wrap up, the final talk of our kind of first uh, season, so to speak, our summer season, 
will be including Sebastian Rastanay from Aspitar and Aspire, who was also a speaker with the heat therapy session, and also Doug Casa, who Trent introduced in terms of as being one of the global heat and cooling experts. So definitely stay tuned to our Twitter at ICEE 2021 and also at the website for more information. And as a final plug, again, I, I just can't thank Evan enough for sharing. And yesterday in our Canadian Sportsnet channel, there was just an absolutely wonderful wonderful uh, interview with him and Diane Jones Kowanowski uh, by Ron McLean, who's kind of the Dean of Canadian sportscasters. So it really sheds light on Evan as a person. And I think you saw that today in the session too. So again, I want to thank everyone for their attendance and thank you to our two panelists and have a great day and take care and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.